This is the Pick 6 Podcast, post-spring football edition, pre-recruiting in the summer edition. I'm Sam McEwen, along with Evan Bland and Dirk Chatlin joining us. Tom Chattel may drop in, you never know. Tom, as he posted on Twitter, is a little bit on the mend from uh, pneumonia, so we'll be uh, continuing to pray for him. Hopefully he's in here today, but if not, we'll hope he's doing well. And since this is May 6th, I want to wish all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. Uh, We all have mothers, and we all have wives who are our mothers. So uh, we thank the the mothers and wives in our lives, and we hope that yours have a, a good Mother's Day. Uh, so thanks for that. It's weird to say that and also recap the spring games for the latest spring game we've ever had. May 1st was the spring game, right? May 1st. So May 1st was the spring game. Most boring first half of a spring game I've ever seen. (laughs) Hopefully they never use that format again in the first half. Worst format ever. Ever. Don't ever use that again. Might as well not even have it. I'll just have one half then. Uh, but we'll recap that. We'll talk a little bit about the quarterback play. I've got some questions that we're going to ask post-spring, which is right now, uh, sometime over the summer, and then right before camp, and then right before the season. And we'll see how we those answers change and if they change. Nebraska added Fordham this week, dropped southeastern Louisiana. I'm not sure that the, the opponent they added is is any worse, honestly, than Southeast or Louisiana, but most people would say they are. And then we'll talk a little baseball. And Nebraska, you know, with all the the world to gain, lost three in a row to Rutgers. To Rutgers. Um, but we'll get to all that here in a minute. Maybe Tom will drop by. You never know. I want to remind everybody that our sponsor is the Schwabach Agency. Team Schwabach is a family-owned all-state insurance agency with four licensed insurance pros saving thousands of Nebraska, Nebraska Husker fans' money. They sell homeowner auto life and flood insurance across Nebraska, and they also insure all the big boy toys, motorcycles, boats, RV, RVs, off-road vehicles. If you've had your roof replaced in the last five years, give Daryl Schwabach, Kyle Schwabach, Nancy Mostek, or Kyle Murdoch a call at 402-590-5200. We're getting into roof season with the hail and the storms. Tornadoes already hitting, so pay attention to that over the summer. Free no obligation insurance reviews and quotes are going to make sure all their fellow Nebraska fans are properly protected. Again, you can contact them at 402-590-5200 or www.nebraskaallstate.com. That's www.nebraskaallstate.com. Thank you to Team Schwabach. All right. Spring game. Uh, Felt more like normal. The fans there helped. Interviewing guys in person after the game felt better. Uh, so from a COVID perspective, it didn't feel like, um, you know, an apocalypse or a pandemic. It didn't feel like Rutgers. So the last game I'd covered was Rutgers, and I'll never, I'll never cover anything like that ever again. That was the strangest experience that I've ever had covering a game. Literally an empty stadium, you know, about four security people in there. Rutgers had two reporters. Nebraska pool was four. Moose didn't show up. Uh, it was Garrett Classy and like three other people. And that was about the entire viewing party of the stadium. It was very strange. It was very dark. Felt like you were, you know, entering a disease pool. The police were outside with police dogs. It, it was like, it was very strange. So has this anybody, wasn't that. It was has good. Anybody, has anybody completed an athletic uh, event with Rutgers involved and said, man, that was, that was really good. That was a lot of fun. That no. was fulfilling. Mm-hmm. That was satisfactory. Rutgers is just like they're the dark cloud on every sporting event that I've ever known. <laughs> For what it's worth, I didn't enjoy it at the time, especially because they kept all the doors open. I think they were afraid of like the circulation. So they kept the doors open at like 27 degrees. And so it was about 40 degrees in the press box. Um, and we were eating Jersey Mike's subs. But I'll never forget it. And I'm glad I did it for that reason. That's a story that I can tell people later on. You know, when I, in the pandemic, the last game that I covered was this weird situation and all the roads in New Jersey were empty. And very strange. It was like, it's like a scene from a movie. Anyway, that was the last time I covered I, I one. I think and, Springsteen wrote a song about the, the Rutgers football game experience during the pandemic. He probably did. He probably did. It'd be like the, uh, It'd be like the, la- the lost lyric to Lost in the Flood. <laughs> so 
I can't even imagine what that would be, you know, how that lyric would go, but it certainly fits that song. Anyway, this spring game was better in that sense that it was just, the weather was nice. We were outside. The players were there. It felt like something close to normal. Um, I'll open the, I'll open the floor and just say, what if anything came out of that event? I think very little came out of the first half. I do think there were a few things to glean out of the second, but what if anything jumped out at you? Either one. Go Evan. I mean, yeah, I agree. The game itself was, it was lacking in any sort of real intrigue. I mean, the backup quarterbacks were, were interesting. I thought what we saw there was essentially what we saw in the open practice a week earlier. I mean, it's hard to get a full judgment of them uh, with the no contact aspect. I mean, especially Logan Smothers, I thought, you, you know, you take away the tackling and, and his ability to run, that's kind of his biggest asset. Um, you know, Harburg impressed. Uh, his arm strength was evident. Obviously, he makes the play there at the end. And you see what some of the guys, uh, the backups did in the second half, which was Good to see. I didn't. I didn't think the running back room necessarily saw anybody gain much separation. That seems like a competition that's going to continue over into the fall. But I, I would just honestly echo what I took most away from it was talking with some of the guys afterwards in a somewhat normal interview session. I mean, we heard from Gabe Irvin for the first time. We had Turner Corcoran coming out wearing a run the damn ball hat. Uh, you know, Samari Torre talking and, and, and Cam Jurgens both talking uh, in more relaxed settings that weren't Zoom, that weren't, uh, you know, weird distanced post-practice sound bites. Like it just, it felt like for the first time since early March 2020, like it was a chance to actually kind of be face to face with some of these guys and get a sense of how they feel about things. And so to me, that was the bigger takeaway was, you know, that 2020 team was, I've never known a team less than I did that team because everything we did was based on zoom. There were no organic side conversations, yes. no little laughs, anything like that. And so like we really been, didn't get to know Luke McCaffrey. I think McCaffrey did well, one interview, yeah, or maybe one interview prior to that season. And he seemed like a hostage <laughs> in every <laughs> single interview we did. Like, it was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. man, he didn't, he I don't think it's his fault. He did not come across well in those interviews. Like he just came across as like, I'm not going to say anything because I don't think I can say anything. It just felt he did. He came across like a hostage. Yeah. And you compare that to like Smothers and Harbor who only spoke once this, this, this spring, but you, you know, you saw their personalities a little bit, especially Harbor. And so that, mm -hmm. that part was, that part was nice. Um, Dirk. Well, I think the backup quarterback was probably the thing that people were talking about most. Um, you know, I, it, it's really hard with the with the non contact stuff in the first half. Um, I think all eyes are pretty much on Nebraska's skill players, so running backs and wide receivers. I thought the running backs, uh, you know, exceeded expectations this spring and and even in the spring game a little bit. Um, the running backs are probably you know, still a big question mark. Um, I think, I think, I still think the defense is going to be really good, even without Honus, you know, even without Will Honus. Um, that just seems like a unit that, you know, Sam, I, I've enjoyed your Chinander stuff. And um, I, I just think that's a unit that, that really could be as good a Nebraska defense as we've seen since. Oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, I mean, maybe 2011, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's. I think you could make a case that it's the best since 2011. So we'll see. They got to prove it. But uh, but I think, you know, the defense having just kind of doing their thing, and some of those guys obviously didn't play. But uh, I, I would still, just in terms of format, I still think it would be fun to turn this thing into kind of a football jamboree where, Me too. you know, you, you do a 40-yard dash thing. Uh, you do – you know, a quarterback, you know, skills competition with, you know, guys trying to hit uprights. And I mean, if, you, if you're not going to take it seriously as a scrimmage, then make it fun and do a bunch of different stuff. Um, I just, I feel like they're trying to have it both ways still. They want to have a scrimmage, but they don't really want to have a scrimmage. And, 
it just kind of comes across as, you know, something you do at a recess. And it's like, well, if, if, if we're going to be silly, let's at least lean into the silly. Uh, and I keep waiting for him to do stuff like that. Now somebody's going to pull a hammy running a 40 yard dash and, you know, everybody's going to scold the coaches for that too. So I realize there's no easy way out, but um, I agree with you that the format of this thing isn't very appealing at this point. Yeah. I would just go to a scrimmage. I think players mentally prepare themselves when they know there's going to be full contact. Obviously the green jerseys on the quarterbacks would remain the same, but what they did the first year was fine. Actually the first two years, um, that format was just fine. I, I'm not sure what the larger purpose of the first half was. Uh, nobody got hurt in the second half that I'm aware of. Um, I think somebody may have pulled something in the first half and kind of hobbled off, but I, you know, I just, yeah, I, I just go to what they had in the second half and just keep that. Um, you know, I don't really think the receivers, it seemed odd to me. That's like, we're not going to tackle Oliver Martin, Omar Manning and Samari Ture, but we're going to tackle all the other receivers. That didn't, that didn't seem to make a lot of sense. I think they won't do that again. Frost Frost demeanor after the game was like, that was too easy for the defense. I think, I think when you have a bunch of recruits in attendance, you want to score football, you want to score football points, you know, put points on the board, throw it around and the wet, the wind and all that other stuff prevented it. Um, I like where Nebraska's lines are. Uh, some of that's just eyeballing it. Some of that's talking to Austin. Some of that's to Iodi, you know, he, he, he's pretty neutral, honestly. I think he wants his guys to keep getting better, but I like where their lines are physically strength, length, height, width, um, size, just sheer size. I like where they are. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that the linebacker spot, it's going to actually be pretty good inside, outside. They need Jojo Doman to stay healthy. He has a track record of staying healthy. So hopefully he does, uh, love the tight ends. I think Evan, you're right. When you say the running backs didn't have much separation, except for the two oldest guys, Tompkins and Johnson, I think they probably are checking their whole card today or after that game, because what I saw from Morrison and Yant and Scott and Irvin tells me those guys are just as good and maybe better than Johnson or Tompkins. That's just me talking. And so those guys probably got to check their whole cart because I don't know that they're going to necessarily be at the top of the charts there. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. And then I'm a little still worried about the skill spots. I think the receivers have to continue to get better. Martinez has to get better. I, I didn't, I thought he played fine in the spring game, but that's probably the word I would use for it. Uh, and then I think their defensive backfield has got to stay healthy and needs to stop the deep pass. So we'll see. Yeah, the, the, the passing game to me is, is still, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, it, I, I think it, Adrian Martinez does look faster and quicker. I mean, there's, yeah. I, I don't think that's much dispute on that. Now, is that because he knows he's not going to get hit? Um, is that because, you know, he's uh, he's indeed lost a little weight and gained a little bit of strength? And, you know, can that carry over? I don't know. But I think if, if Martinez can be a little bit more um, dangerous, you know, like might go the distance dangerous, mm-hmm. uh, I think that that creates – you know, adds to the conundrum of, of this offense. It's like, okay, if Adrian's best skill set is the fact that he might go 60 yards, uh, are we going to run him 20 times a game? It's just, you know, it, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. I, I'm not convinced that he's going to be the Big Ten's best passer, um, even with better receivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, me too. They're running some stuff schematically even on the spring game they're running some stuff that that they used to run with taylor martinez so in particular there was a play where they pulled a guard and i think the op and and the opposite play side tackle so it was sichterman and i think the left tackle i can't remember it was sichterman or the left guard the left tackle and they 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 faked a pass or they faked a run to the left and then they had Martinez follow those two pullers. And if you go back to the 2012 Michigan State game, you'll see that Taylor scored a, I don't know, 75-yarder on that exact same play. 
And it's very, very similar. And I like some of the things we're doing. I mean, it's more power football, pin and pull, um, get guys out in front, let your quarterback kind of rumble. But at the same time, you, you really do want to make sure that you're throwing the football. And if there's one thing that Taylor Martinez could do, and he was not a good passer on a lot of fronts, but Taylor was good at throwing the ball from 10 yards in. He was good at it. Go back and watch the games. When he needed to throw the ball to Quincy and Nunwa on that little double out, it was right where it needed to be. Um, when he threw quick screens, except for the 2012 title game, it was a pretty good throw. Um, he did a good job of throwing that pass, and he was he was good at those things. And, and Martinez still needs work there. I mean, it's just one of the things they've got to get better at is when you're throwing the ball on a on a on a dump pass. A, you got to throw it quicker, and B, you got to throw it not a foot over the guy's head. And so there, there's little things there that I think they've got to continue to improve. And some of that's with him, you know, and uh, if you're going to, the completion rate's great. 75% is super, but you know, 6.6 yards per, per attempt is not very good. And I think that's where he was. That may have been lower than that. So he's got to work on that. Um, we still don't really know anything about special teams. I don't think it's just no way to know. So, and that's a huge question mark. A fan sent me, and I'm going to start doing this thing called a stat chat like every week, very soon about like just key stats that people need to think about and like ways to think about the football game. That's maybe a little different than we have in the past. And so I've really, really, really been trying to harp on this, this idea of how important it is to have a kickoff specialist. Like it's not a joke. It's, it's like one of the most important positions on the team now. So this fan, Stu Manji, Eric is, I don't know. Anyway, his handle is at Stu Manji. He sent me this, and it's, this graphic is amazing. In a three-year total, opponents kicked the ball off 187 times, got 87 touchbacks, and allowed 1,181 yards to Nebraska. Nebraska's kickoff unit, kickoff return unit. In that same time period, Nebraska kicked the ball off 178 times, got only 60 touchbacks, and wait for this, allowed 2,125 return yards and three touchdowns. So double? Double. Wow. <laughs> double rainbow. <laughs> I mean, double kickoff return. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. And, you know, it's, I guess it's unforgettable. No, and the point is they don't have a kickoff special. They don't have somebody who can kick it into the end zone. And if you, in particular, if you look at this graphic, you will notice, and he did a great job of it. It's on one of my whatevers. It was pretty comparable in 2018. The returns were awful because Maurice Washington didn't know how to return them. But Nebraska's touchback percentage in 2018 was 47.2%. That's because Caleb Lightborn was kicking them off. And if Caleb could do anything, he could kick the ball a long way straight. So it's pretty comparable that year. 490 return yards for Nebraska, 695 for the opponents. In 2019, it went 417 to 932. In 2020, it was 274 and 498. Mm. So it's just that kind of stuff. You, there's just no other way to resolve it other than to get a guy that can do it or to have super stark, you know, coverage units. And I, we won't know anything about that until it happens. The punting issue, I think, is still an issue. I don't know that they have an elite punter. It's really hard to tell. And uh, so. Sam, I, I just think, I mean, this is the – we're going to get into some deeper stuff, but this is the theme of Nebraska football over the last 20 years. It's like this silent erosion of all the things that you don't necessarily notice – um, you know, it's, it's kickoff return yardage. It's, it's turnover margin. It's, you know, field position. It's, um, um, you know, it's, uh, there, there was a prominent one that I was going to point out, uh, that slips my mind, but, but it's just, it's crazy how, like, I find this over and over that you don't, it's like you don't recognize how bad it is until you really start digging into it. Your eyes to, Oh, I was, I was, I was going to say uh, the pass rush thing. Um, you know, they're just all of these components that are, that make up a good football team. You know, there's 50 boxes to check. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, 
Nebraska is just flat out terrible at like 10 of them. And you don't even necessarily notice it until you start really, really digging. And I'm sure people that know football better than I do, you know, do notice it with their eyes. Um, but man, I just can't get over stuff like that. You know, if you, if you took those numbers and compared them to any power five team in the country, I guarantee you Nebraska is in the last three or four. Uh, and it's, it's that way in so many different little things that you wonder how this team wins as many games as it does. You know, it's like, they're not good, but based on some of those numbers that we cite over and over and over, I always come back to turnovers. Uh, it, it should be worse than it is. And, and I just, Nebraska's got to clean that stuff up. I mean, even if they can just get to mediocre at that stuff, can you yeah. imagine how much how much better they could be? Much. I mean, it's it's just no question that the things that have sunk the program, like where we're sitting, I mean, I haven't watched a game on TV, but I'm sitting there at Rutgers, and I'm like, Nebraska is so much bigger and stronger than Rutgers that it's kind of comical. Like Rutgers was small and slow and weak by comparison. And I'm like, and it's 28, 21 because this team cannot hold on to the stinking football. It should have been 42 to 10. I'm not kidding. The, the physical differences were vast and it was obvious in person. I mean, Rutgers is just a small football team and Greg Shiano will change that, that, but they're small and they were, they almost won the game because Nebraska's game management and turnover issues and special teams issues are so significant. <laughs> they almost, you know, found a way to – it's like a company that has actually a pretty good product that you'd want to buy if only the front of the house knew how to sell it. Or if only, you know, if only you had somebody uh, – customer service on the phone who knew how to answer a phone. Instead, when they had, had answer the phone, they got butter all over their hands and they dropped the phone. <laughs> they only answer like eight out of ten phones because two of them, they can't actually hope, open the phone. It's just – it's these little things that seem so obvious to us, you know, as journalists, but seem elusive, elusive to the team. And of course, we're not 6'4 and 325 pounds. We're not Ethan Piper jumping on a false start. We're not that guy. We don't know what it's like to be him. So it's easy to judge. It's easy to judge. But at the same time, so many other teams don't do these things. They just don't do them. So at some point, you want to see Nebraska not do them too. We're going to talk some big questions. Yeah. All right. So I, I sent these guys some questions yesterday. We're going to try to answer these now, but but we'll also a couple different times during the off season we will do it again, and then maybe during the season. And you guys can. I'm going to keep the first question I sent you to last because I think that one's kind of an interesting question. But um, we'll start with this. What, if any, big picture aspect of Nebraska's team looks like a Big Ten contender? And by Big Ten contender, I mean winning the West Division. I can go. Uh, I mean, I don't know how big picture we're talking. If we're talking on the field big, we've touched on the defense, but with the amount of experience they have back, with how they finished the year last year, I mean, obviously that's going to be a strength of the team. That could be something that uh, they could lean on as a potential contender. Um, but I think in, in a bigger sense, what the program has shown in the last few years is that they're good at talent acquisition. I mean, they're regularly pulling in top 25 type recruiting classes. Now the development and all that, that's a totally different conversation, but mm -hmm. in terms of getting recruits to campus for summer, you know, for Friday night lights events for fall recruiting for the commits that they have gotten, just to that point, just up to signing day, uh, they've done a very good job beating the bushes, finding guys in interesting places, leading the West or being right near the top of the West uh, in terms of star rankings and, and all that stuff mm -hmm. translates as, as we've seen with some teams at the top. So just in that sense, they have been very good at identifying kids, uh, putting out blanket net of offers and then getting the guys to campus and ultimately committing. They've been very good at that. Yeah. Sam, I, I want to state the obvious because I think it's it's Nebraska's strength right now. And I, I think I think their defensive coordinator and his uh, the the experience and depth that he's accumulated on that side of the ball is is Big Ten Big Ten West champion caliber right now. Um, 
I would not have said that three years ago. I'm shocked that I'm saying it now. Uh, but Nebraska, I think, is going to have a really, really good defense. Um, and so if if they do contend in the West, I think it's going to be because of that. You know, I the all three levels, I think, are really good. Um, you know, obviously health is critical. But, uh, you know, if they can find any semblance of an edge rusher, um, I think Nebraska could be a top – you know, 15 defense in the country. Mm. I just, that guy doesn't appear to be on the roster. Um, but, but even still, I think, you know, Nebraska can, can potentially be the best defense in the West. Mm. I agree with you. Um, I, I, I do wonder, and it's, it's a very small sample size, but Evan and I felt really good about Blaze Gunner coming out of high school and he had a nice spring game. I mean, it's no joke that he, you know, he shoved Turner Corcoran back into a pocket. He went and got a sack. It was a legit thing. So that was a good play. Mm-hmm. And he's a big kid. I thought that was nice. I know they still love Jamari Butler. And Phil Darius Payne's going to be an, a motor guy. So now that Payne's lost a little bit of weight and he had a weird last year, what you hope is you can get five or six sacks from him out of just motor. He plays really hard. He never quits. <clears throat> And he's not maybe the fastest guy, but he'll get you something just because he because he plays hard. And so I I, th- I think their pass rush will be slightly better. But when you say Dirk, when you said you know 2011, I was like, yeah, I agree with that defense. I I think 2013 was good, and the thing that that defense had that this one doesn't was Randy Gregory, and that dovetails into your draft thing, which we'll we'll get to in a minute. Um, of like this idea that what Nebraska lacks is just an elite player. Like they don't have that first round pick or second round pick for that matter. So that's something that we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. What remains the program's biggest big picture weakness? So big picture weakness, what remains the program's biggest big picture weakness? I mean, it's it's the identity piece. What what do they want to be? Um, you know, the, when when Scott Frost and company arrived, they continued to recruit those smaller, quicker type athletes. Uh, you know, you've detailed it recently, Sam, but that's transformed over the last couple cycles or evolved into more of a, a bigger bodied sort of approach uh, with the receivers, the skill positions, uh, certainly on the lines. So it, it feels like. You know, Scott Frost's famous quote when he came was that the Big Ten would adjust to them, and now they're adjusting to the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. But it feels to me like they're still trying to find that sweet spot between Big Ten Maulers and that AAC kind of spread style offense. Mm-hmm. And as I was thinking about it, you know, when they arrived, the message was that the staff would have a long runway, a long time to establish something uh, and build on that over the course of many years. But when you look at what they've recruited and brought in, it feels like the first couple of years of that uh, almost kind of fell by the wayside because they were still figuring out what they wanted to be. I think when when they arrived, it seemed like they knew what they wanted and they had a vision for what they wanted. But I think in reality, it's taken them two or three years to adjust to the big 10 and figure out what that is. And so if you don't have that, identity in mind, then you can't recruit a specific guy. And if you can't recruit the specific players, then you can't develop them. And then that translates into what we've seen in the NFL draft, which is not very many guys going in the last four to five years. So to me, it starts with identity. What do you want to be? And then everything else that we can talk about development and such uh, flows out of that. Dirk. Yeah. I, Evan makes a great point. I think, you know, fans are, are, you know, for good reason, frustrated by Scott Frost and, and where he is in year four. Yep. But the reality is, and this is not an excuse for it, for it, but the reality is I think they're closer to year two. I mean, they just, they kind of just dropped the ball. I think the first couple of years, um, uh, they, they didn't, as Evan said, I don't, I don't think they really knew what they were getting into. And I think where they are on defense right now is where they should be on offense right now. Um, now some of that is because of the super senior stuff, but, 
But uh, I felt like, you know, Eric Chenander had a better idea of what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it than, uh, than Scott Frost did on offense. Um, to get to your big picture weakness question, I'm tempted to say the skill position players because I think it's – if you went back three, four years and, and said this is where Nebraska would be from a skill position standpoint, I think we'd all be shocked. Um, I'm tempted to say player development, but I, I'm going to give them a little bit of a – benefit of the doubt there um, based on how they've, you know, improved on the offensive and defensive lines. I think the biggest picture weakness is what we already talked about, which is just the game management stuff. Yeah. Nebraska has been very, very poor at all the little things. And uh, that's basically the difference between them and a program like Iowa or Northwestern, you know, that has a breakout season. Um, Nebraska has to clean that stuff up. And I, and I don't know whether it's concentration, whether it's coaching, whether it's, you know, practice regimen. I think there's lots of potential things that it could be. Uh, but for Nebraska to be taken seriously, uh, they've got to clean up all that little stuff. And I, I feel like that's the biggest program weakness right now. Mm. I, I echo both those things. I'll just add this, that, that I think um, Nebraska's got a head coach who – uh, is trying to do trying to juggle a lot of things all at once. He's trying to be a lot of different things, I think, to a lot of different people. He's trying to appeal to his former teammates. Uh, he's trying to appeal to the fan base to some degree. He's trying to worry about the city of Lincoln and the businesses down there and the impact on them. Um, you know, there's I think there's some in there of like I need to run this program the way Tom Tom Osborne ran it. And I would just hope that at some point Frost is able to reach a point in his, in his career here where he's like, I'm just going to do me and I'm going to do it my way. And if people don't like that, they don't have to like it, but I'm the one who's got the job and I'm the one who has the pressure and we're going to go ahead and just do it the way I want to do it. And I'm still not sure that he's there. And he would probably hear that and go, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, but there's just this part of me that thinks I don't know why a guy like this wants a team of 160 guys. I, I don't know why other than to do it because that's what you, you're supposed to do when you're at Nebraska. That's the only conclusion I can come to because I don't, it's not that I don't see the potential benefits of that, but he just, I just doesn't strike me as a guy who just absolutely loves recruiting literally 22 walk-ons a year and 24 scholarship recruits and this massive revolving door. Cause you can't keep all those walk-ons. It's money ball. Essentially you're doing, and Dirk, you wrote about this, what, 12 years ago when you did the formula piece, Osborne's approach was money ball. It was, we're going to bring so many guys onto the team that like somewhere in there, we're going to get a couple of diamonds in the rough over here. And we're going to get and the walk-ons are going to affect this scholarship guy over here and when it all comes together, we're going to have a better team than most rosters because we put it together differently. And my point would be that it's a harder to do that than ever now because school costs a lot more money and guys are a lot less willing to put themselves through five years of punishment to just stay out there and be practice fodder. And B, it just doesn't seem to be like his – Maybe it is his DNA like that, that he just really loves having 160 guys on the team. Maybe that's, maybe it is, but it doesn't seem like it. And I didn't understand the hiring an analyst or off the field analyst to run special teams last year. And, and then making the, the pointed statement of saying, well, we don't Mike Dawson. We don't want to put that on his plate. And then putting it on his plate a year later, because it was obvious that you had to put it on his plate because you couldn't like, there's been decisions that have been made along the way that just don't make a lot of sense to me. And it feels like they're trying to do things in a, like maybe in a smarter way or in a, what you would call an heterodox way that it's just not all that necessary. And it feels like at times trying too hard or I want this guy at this position because he's bigger and I want to do that and that. And it's like, maybe you should just play the guy that's the best to play there. Um, it feels like at times there's just been situations like that. The quarterback switch last year was, was odd to me. If you're not going to give Luke McCaffrey more than a two and a half games to do it. Like he got, he got a game and a half and then they pulled the plug. 
So why did you switch to the guy if you weren't going to give him the whole season to show what he could do? Adrian Martinez had two and a half years to be the guy, and then you then you bench him, and then you give his replacement a game and a half. What are you doing? Like, why? Why not give him the whole season? And I think it's because, well, we lost Illinois, so we can't lose again. So now we got to put – like, it just – it's those kind of issues that I think they have to still work through. And, and I think I often think about what you once said, Dirk, about this idea that it's one thing to say you're going through a rebuild or, or this is going to be a tough year. And then it's another thing to actually live it out week by week. And so, like, I think sometimes maybe that's you lose something, that they've, something that they've fallen into, too, where it's where it said, OK, this is going to we're trying to accomplish X, Y, Z this year. We're going to rebuild. We're going to replenish the talent, whatnot. But then. The moment comes and you hear the pissed off fans in Memorial Stadium and you hear how that affects people. And, and Scott Frost is extremely plugged into Husker Nation. He knows what guys are feeling. And so you make decisions in the moment to try to win the games uh, and, and find success in the short term. And then that kind of handicaps you in the long term. And it just feels like so often he's kind of stuck somewhere in the middle. Yes. At okay. times, it doesn't feel like football. It feels more like you're trying to do something else and not just play good football, but like for the things. And, I, and I'm not saying I'm not being I'm not trying to be critical of him. I'm saying for his sake, I hope he just does it his way and doesn't worry too much about which constituency is happy or not happy about that. He just does it his way. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Isn't the Oklahoma Southeast Louisiana thing a classic example yes. of this, though? I mean, wasn't that Frost sort of dipping his toe in the water and saying, This is actually, I actually don't want to get my brains beat in by Oklahoma in September. Uh, I want to start four and zero and give myself a chance this year. And yes. look at the look at the blowback to that. So, like, right, Bill Snyder could have done it, Scott Frost can't do it. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, yes. Oklahoma, and this is it. See, people may have an impression this is like number nine, Oklahoma. This is like, oh, come on. This is Oklahoma. No, this is the number one team in the country. They're going to be the preseason number one. They're better than Alabama. I like, they're the best team in the country. They're number one. So they're going to play the number one team in the country in the fourth week of the season. That's going to happen. But look how we responded to that. I, I mean, know. and I, and I, I mean, I about, I about, you know, fell out of my chair when I saw what they were doing. Well, um, because you got to take it on the chin. You, hey, it's a game. It's a 50th anniversary. You go and you play. You take your medicine. And they figured it out either way. They got four of them. So. I, I just think it's a classic example of yes. what you're talking about. Oh. Yes. It is. I think he tried to dip his toe in that, and he was trying to take care of his team, and he got blowback for it. And, you know, and again, do I really appreciate this idea that the football facility is will include an academic center and a training table and a lobby for all student athletes? Yes, I think that's just a wonderful tip of the cap or whatever you want to call it. That That's great. I, I think that's great. But that's an example, again, of like they need a football building really now. They need it. They're behind every other Big Ten team. You know, it didn't need to be a hundred and fifty five million dollar project. You can build the the the, the food place, the, the the mess hall, and the student center later, you know. So, and they broke it up into phases, which was good. But it's just little things like that where you just feel like Scott has a feels. It feels like Scott has to do more than just coach a winning football team. You know, it feels like there's more, and I don't think that's necessarily fair to him, to the program. Like, just go win games, and then. The rising tide will lift all boats. All right, next question. Uh, what are reasonable expectations for Adrian Martinez? Assume a 12-game schedule. Well, I, I'm going to state it in this context. I think he can be – be—I think he can be one of the top two quarterbacks in the Big Ten. And I would leave, I would leave the other spot open to – you know, I don't think anybody enters the season more prepared uh, to be better than him. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, Ohio State uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't produce somebody better because it's Ohio State. But uh, but I think, you know, expectations should be really high for Adrian based on 
um, based on his experience level and based on his skill set. And no, I don't think he's one of the top, you know, three or four passers in the Big Ten, but but uh, but I also think he's going to get a little bit more help at receiver this year. And I think he's, you know, he's incredibly prepared. I think he's an incredibly impressive young man. Uh, I think, you know, there's a decent chance that Adrian has a, a breakout season, sort of a second breakout season. Evan? I mean, from a win-loss perspective, they got to make a bowl game. He's a fourth-year starter. He's eleven and six. Or Nebraska is eleven and sixteen when he starts in his career. Uh, this much as he's, he's invested this much. Nebraska's invested this much. You got to make a bowl game this year. I think that's a reasonable expectation from that point of view. I think just with Martinez, though, the good needs to outweigh the bad by a greater margin this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at he's done some great stuff in his time in Nebraska, some great runs. Uh, He's made plays when they aren't there. Uh, But you look at some of the numbers, 22 rushing touchdowns in his career, but he has 27 career fumbles and 15 of those have been lost. So, you know, that, that, that kind of is a wash. He has 31 touchdown passes to 20 interceptions in his career. And in the last two years, that's 14 touchdowns to 12 interceptions. So you kind of have this one-to-one thing where, you're helping and you're hurting and, and you kind of come out somewhere in the middle. So the, the ability is there. I think as a fourth year guy, though, the, you got to clean up those mistakes a little bit more, uh, you know, take away, take away most of those fumbles or interceptions. And then if that has to decrease the touchdown percentage a little bit, fine, just increase the margin there between what you're doing well and how you're actively hurting the team with turnovers. Sam, I, I would say, I'm not, this is a small sample size, but I think there's probably a cautionary tale um, in, in the Taylor Martinez, Tommy Armstrong scenario, because, you know, you kind of waited for those guys to get over the hump and finally have their banner season as a senior. And it, it didn't really happen. Um, And I think, you know, we have a tendency, I probably personally have a tendency to think, okay, it's the last year this guy's finally going to kind of figure it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reality is by the time you've started, you know, 30 college games, you kind of are what you are. So uh, I find myself kind of going back and forth between personally, just thinking uh, it's a senior, the sense of urgency, the sense of maturity, all this stuff, you know, the guy's finally going to figure it out. But I remind myself that I've, I've thought that before. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and it's just tough to sort of flip a switch after 30 career starts and be a different player. Yes. If, if Adrian has Taylor Martinez's junior year, he will be Big Ten Player of the Year. So it's worth noting that Taylor had, an, had, a, now Taylor had great supporting cast, duly noted. But Taylor threw for 2,871 yards and 23 touchdowns as a junior. He ran for 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. That would make Martinez Player of the Year. And they would also win the West if he does that. I feel pretty confident with that. Um, I don't think he's going to do those numbers. But for what it's worth, here are the last oh multi-year senior starters that Nebraska has. Multi-year, so we're not including Sam Keller. Tommy Armstrong, Taylor Martinez, Joe Gans, Zach Taylor, Jamal Lord, Eric Crouch, Tommy Frazier, Mike Grant, Sort of, yes, he, he sort of counts. He was replaced by Frazier midway through the season, but Mike Grant. Jerry Gadowski did not play multiple, he did not start multiple seasons. He started one, but it was one of the great best in school history. Steve Taylor, Turner Gill, since 1980. Those are your fourth, those are your senior multi year starters. And that includes what? <clears throat> Four of the 10 best quarterbacks in Nebraska school history, maybe five. Number one, Frazier. Number two, Crouch or Gill, whichever you prefer in that spot. So there's those three. I would put Zach Taylor among the 10 best in school history. He's probably dueling it out with Ferragamo and Dave Hum. And, you know, I think Steve Taylor probably belongs in there too. Other people disagree with that, but I think he does. So there you go. 
If there was one team where you said Nebraska should be more like them, what team is it? I could say Iowa and trigger people. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I'll go first. Notre Dame. Yeah. I think Nebraska can be Notre Dame or something very close to that. Notre Dame has chosen to hang its hat on a big physical offensive line, a big athletic defense, running the football, and a quarterback who doesn't make too many mistakes. And they have big receivers and tight ends. Like Notre Dame is one of the biggest teams in the country. Their tight ends are big. Their receivers are big. Their last two tight ends have been picked in the NFL draft. Notre Dame, that's the team that I think Nebraska can, can become. And Brian Kelly is a spread, no huddle guy in the past. But they've changed the way they play. They're more physical. They're more of a pro-style team. But they still have shotgun spread elements. Notre Dame. Yeah, it's a good answer. I mean, the we, we often fall back on Wisconsin. Um, but I, I, I agree with you that I think Nebraska, you know, can be, and, and probably needs to be a little bit more dynamic, a little bit versatile offensively. Um, Wisconsin obviously has an identity that, that they've mastered, but, um, I agree that Nebraska, I think offensively needs to be a little bit more creative than that. Um, so I think Notre Dame's a good one. That's, uh, I would concur with that. Well, I will throw out Iowa, and I know that's Ken. Ken, Boo! but and again, this isn't. That's not to say that that's the final destination for Nebraska. But, but, but look, I mean, the Hawkeyes—they have their stability in that program. That those guys don't beat themselves. My goodness, they have an identity that they've recruited to for a long time. They develop talent and produce NFL draft picks at a pretty high rate. And then you look, uh, they, they have a high floor. And, and I think Nebraska should be a program that has a high floor. I mean, the last 20 years, I was missed like two bowl games. So their bad seasons aren't that bad. And their good seasons, those 11 and two years that they they've had, had no they were undefe- undefeated in 2015. Like there's no reason Nebraska can't have a season like that over the course of a decade, uh, two seasons like that, where they win 10, 11 games. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's no reason that shouldn't be the case at Nebraska. So in those senses, more from a, a cultural sense, maybe than a schematic uh, one, I, I think absolutely Nebraska would benefit from being more like Iowa. I would have said coming into the league or when Frost got here, that they were going to try to be more like Oklahoma. They were going to be the big 12 team in the big 10. And I just don't know if that's going to be their identity. I think their identity is going to be a little bit more physical than that. Maybe if they can throw the ball a little bit more than some other teams, yes. But, you know, I, I was wrong. I like saying I'm wrong. I say it often to my wife. Um, I was wrong. I thought when I was watching Nebraska and Purdue in 2018, when Purdue beat Ohio State, you guys remember that game, um, Purdue beat Ohio State, Nebraska was starting to get going. Even after an 0-6 start, I'm like, that's the future. That's the future of this league. In, in five years, we're going to be talking about Nebraska and Purdue throwing the ball around the yard. Maybe they're not winning the Big Ten West, but they're both pretty good, and you got to work look out for them. That hasn't happened. Um, what has happened is North – and for what it's worth, Wisconsin is worse. They're not as good of a program. Northwestern won two of the last three Big Ten, title, Big Ten West titles – and very, very easily, Wisconsin could have lost the one in whatever year that was. They beat Minnesota on the last weekend, right, uh, in 2019. Wisconsin's not as good as it was five years ago. I don't care what anybody says. They have suffered a decline. They're not as good of a program. But what has happened is you've seen Northwestern, which plays a hell of a lot like Notre Dame, fill that gap. And Minnesota – which is a big team that runs the ball and throws play action passes has filled the gap. It hasn't been Purdue and it hasn't been Nebraska. So I was wrong. I didn't, I didn't anticipate Minnesota and Northwestern being those teams. Guys, what is the, uh, what's the position that went number four in the NFL draft? What's the position that transformed new England's offense? What's the position that is arguably most important to Patrick Mahomes? What is the position that has been the showcase uh, for Iowa football over the last five or 10 years? Yeah. Uh, it's the tight end. Yeah. And, and Nebraska is either lucking itself into or 
you know, t- I'm not I'm not suggesting that there's that they didn't do it on purpose, but uh, Nebraska oh, can, ne- Nebraska can be what Iowa is in terms of tight end no question production and development yeah and, and if it is if Nebraska is running two tight end sets and you know one time you line him up you know Thomas Fedoni you line him up on the end and uh, you know you run power to his side and the next time you split him out wide and you match him up against the safety or a linebacker. That is most likely Nebraska's best uh, path to offensive success. So Amen. I think we, we again, we never would have said that four years ago. We never would have envisioned it. But man, that sure seems like Nebraska's best ticket. And those guys actually grow up here. That's the yep. great thing. It sucks that Caden Helms and Mike Riley Ducker are not going to go to Nebraska. It, it's too bad. I don't know how things are going to go for them. I, I I hope the best for them. They're good kids. They're smart. I think one of them is going to go to OU, which I don't know what OU is going to do with their tight ends, and I don't know exactly where the other one's going to go. Riley Ducker might go to Auburn or somewhere else, and that's all great. But the Big Ten's a great place for a tight end to be, and and you know Nebraska. That's these are the kind of kids you get in Nebraska. They were former basketball players growing up. They're about 6'5", 245. That's a tight end. Guys, there's there's an Austin Allen every year at the Boys State Basketball Tournament. There is. Um, and, and you know, maybe some that are better than Austin Allen. Um, so N- Nebraska is uh, – we talk a lot about recruiting, you know, territory and and the types of players that come out of your state. Man, there's, there's a lot of kids like that, and – you know, I think a lot of them are multi-sport athletes uh, that that are are good competitors. You know, really strong based yep. on you know football, basketball, track. Uh, sometimes they're a little bit unpolished, probably like Austin Allen was coming out. But uh, but that can be a pipeline that Frost really leans into. And if you you know if you go back at Osborne's, if you go back to Osborne's offenses, you know one of his components of his genius was that he identified his deficiencies and he hid those deficiencies. So, you know, he knew that he couldn't bring in NFL wide receivers. So he created an offense that, that covered up those weaknesses uh, at the same time that enhanced his strengths. And I think Frost could do the same thing. Amen to that. That's a great point. That's a terrific point because the offense that Frost brought here actually re- re- relies upon great receivers. And they've modified that a little. That's a hell of a point. Last question. If you had to pick six wins right now in Nebraska's 2021 schedule, what six would it be? That gets into a bowl. I would go, I would go the first three, Illinois, Ford, and Buffalo. Um, And then I would go, uh, I would go Purdue at home. And I got to find two more. And I would probably take, uh, I don't trust that Michigan State game after Oklahoma, so I would pick Northwestern at home, and then I would probably pick, um, I would probably pick a road win at Minnesota. Okay, there's your six. You want to go seven, or you just feel good with six? No, I think they'll get to. I think they'll get to seven. Um, to seven. I, I think they'll beat Michigan or Iowa. Um, or Michigan State. I just, I just am not sure that I trust that that road game right after Oklahoma. So Dirk uh, six for Illinois, Fordham, Buffalo, Purdue, at Minnesota. Minnesota, Minnesota Northwestern. Northwestern. Okay. Evan? Mine's pretty similar. Uh, Illinois, Fordham, Buffalo, I think are all <clears throat> very winnable. Purdue at home. Uh, Northwestern at home. I think Michigan State has a ways to go as a program, even coming off of the Oklahoma game for Nebraska. I just yeah. I think Michigan State's starting over in a lot of different ways, and so that's a game that Nebraska can go win. So I, overall, I would give them seven as well. I think those are the six that I would feel the best about. And then Who's I your would bonus s- seven. Well, whoever the seventh is, I think it's one of. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, or Iowa. I think they beat one of, one what's, of those. What's teams. your bonus seven? Michigan would okay. be my bonus seven. And it's what was your home. bonus seven? You got to pick just one, Dirk. Uh, Michigan. Okay. 
my list is exactly the same as Evans. So we have the same, we have the same list and I have seven, but the six and then Michigan instead of at Minnesota. Otherwise our lists are ex- almost exactly the same. Well, no, that's not quite true. So Dirk, Dirk does not have Michigan state. He has the others. So the one he doesn't have is at Michigan state and he does have at Minnesota and we have at Michigan state and not at Minnesota. Now keep in mind that that is that's, telling the, that's telling the listeners that, that none of us are picking them to beat Iowa at the start of the year, uh, which, well, if you're telling me seven, no, I know, those, but that those are the first seven that I come and, and this is where I say, now what we're saying is I was better than Northwestern. And I believe that I believe it every year. Now that doesn't always bear out in the games. <laughs> Lord knows Northwestern has beaten Iowa multiple times, including twice in a row at home. Um, but I'm hard pressed every year to say Northwestern's better than Iowa or Nebraska for that matter. The fact that they beat those teams is a commentary on the teams they beat more than it's a commentary on Northwestern. But that leads us into the piece that Dirk wrote earlier this week, which was short and to the point that Nebraska has struggled to have players drafted at the top of the NFL draft. And the reason that Northwestern is pertinent is for maybe the first time in since forever, Northwestern had two players selected in the first round of the NFL draft Rashawn Slater who didn't play this year. So he really doesn't count because he didn't even play this season. He opted out. And Greg Newsom, who was a cornerback there, who was not rated as high as many, many cornerbacks that Nebraska has selected and did not successfully develop. Nebraska's issue is that they haven't had a, uh, they haven't had a top 100 player selected since Amir Abdullah. Is that right there? Top 100. Um, or was Malik Collins, the last one. Yeah, Collins, I think, would have been top 100. I gotta, I gotta check that. So basically, since 2016, they haven't had a top 100 pick. One and of course, the pick. offensive drought goes back a long ways in terms of yeah. first rounders. But I'll let you take it from there. No, it's it's one. You know, 150 is kind of the cutoff. Um, you know, Hymas was the top guy. You know, for five years, and you know, first 150 guy in five years, and. Um, you know, Nebraska is just, they've just lacked the game breaker. They've lacked, they've lacked, you know, it's, it's like I described it to you last week. They got to have the best player on the field more often than they do. Um, this is not basketball where the best player in the field almost always wins, but, uh, but it is a situation where Nebraska just doesn't have enough difference makers. And, and, you know, we can point to quarterback pass rusher, you know, lots of different positions where that really matters. Um, but but Nebraska, you know, almost almost stunningly so is so far behind in producing those, you know, top 150 NFL draft picks. Um, and again, I sort of go back to not that this matters, but it's it, it matters in our perception. You know, I look at Stanley Morgan, Divina Zigbo. I mean, these are guys that people around here loved, you know, I mean, they really thought were great great players. And I enjoyed watching them too, but NFL scouts did not agree. And um, there's, there's just, there's a huge disconnect right now and has been for the last decade, frankly, uh, between where Nebraska fans think their players are on the talent scale and where NFL scouts think Nebraska players are on the talent scale. And uh, man, at some point that's got to change if Nebraska is going to get good. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, a couple I mean, to, things. Be, to, be, to be frank, Sam, they need they need an Amir Abdullah and a Levante David. I mean, they, they just Ohio State's got five of those guys every year. Um, Iowa's got two of those guys every year. Nebraska needs one of them, and they haven't had one of them for quite a while. A mm. couple thoughts. First, yes, I think that's true. Um, they really struggled to get the kind of players in here or when they've gotten the athletes who you're like, that guy could be really special. He, he doesn't last. He leaves a program or something like that. The late, the latest, honestly, if you look at Omar Manning, they're like, that guy should play in the NFL. Now it's up to Nebraska to figure out how he, they're going to develop him and and put him in that spot. You know, like how are they going to Nebraska's got to get this kid in a position to be really, really good. 
The second thing I'll say is the NFL is, is, is really changing. And, and one of the things that's changing about it is, is college production is getting turned down. And I don't want to say the scouts arrogance, but arrogance is getting turned up. Um, there's, there's just really not a lot of justification for some of the players who didn't get drafted. It seems strange to me. And some of the players who were selected in the first round of the NFL draft, where they were, is very surprising. And it's been, it's been anecdotally proven. I mean, if you go back and look at it, Alabama players are overrated by the scouts. The player, Alabama players, receivers are an exception. Receivers are an exception. Many, many Alabama players are overrated. They're, they're not nearly as good as their NFL draft status would, would confer on them. And that, that covers many, many, many positions. Not receiver. Receiver, it's not true. And interior defensive line, you know, it's not true. Marcel Darius was a very good player, so on and so on. But Alabama quarterbacks have not been good. Tua, Tua was not good last year. And anybody who tells you that Tua was good didn't watch Tua very much. And so there's questions about whether Mac Jones is actually very good. Most of the Alabama running backs, with the exception of Derrick Henry, who could have been good at UNO, have not been very good. So there's been things, there's things going on in the drafts that, that there's, there's things going on. I can't explain to you why Jarrett Patterson wasn't drafted. I don't know why. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And 20 years ago, he would have been drafted in the third round. I don't know why he wasn't drafted. I, it's, it's baffling to me. But that doesn't explain why Nebraska no, it doesn't. is so far it doesn't. behind Big Ten peers. I mean, it doesn't. You know, what, what, what Iowa has done with NFL draft production compared to Nebraska, no uh, question, is just startling. No question. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that there are great college players like Patty Fisher at Northwestern, who I think, I don't know, was all Big Ten four years in a row and he wasn't drafted. I don't know why. Like, I can't speak to that. Did he not run a 40 well enough? Is he not move laterally well enough? I don't know. But those kind of things are odd to me. Like, I don't really understand. I think that there's just things that are like, this guy's going to be good, and this guy's not going to be good, and we think so because we think so. And there you go. And, you know, if you were to ask Brendan Hymas, I think Brendan Hymas would say he thinks he's a first or second round draft pick and that he, he's going to prove that very quickly. And so he's so the Chargers drafted Rashawn Slater, and you know Hymas's perspective is Rashawn Slater might play at guard and I may play at tackle. Now Hymas is a confident guy, but I think he might be right. I think he might. <laughs> I think Slater's going to be a really good guard in the NFL. Sam, I just think, and this goes back to player development, but take a guy like Lamar Jackson. Okay. Yes, he should have gotten drafted. Lamar Jackson comes in, the, the the optimistic Nebraska fans are thinking, that's a first-round guy. That's Fabian Washington. Right. Um, and and four years later, he doesn't get drafted. And, you know, he's he's been in the NFL a little bit. Um, but that's a guy from a player development standpoint where you're just like, what is Nebraska doing wrong? Right. That's fair. where that guy, that guy under the old system – is a sure even Bill Callahan's system or even Bo Pelini's system, that guy is probably a top three round NFL draft pick. And Agreed. instead he's not getting selected at all. What is what is the flaw in the machine where that guy is not improving between his freshman year and senior year like he would have 10 or 20 years ago? Sure. That's fair. I agree with you. I agree. He did get better. He was better as a senior. And again, and this, I, I'm, I'm augmenting your point when I say Nebraska is somewhere, and this was true in Riley and now apparently in Frost. Nebraska's got to do a better job of communicating somehow that these kids, they got to win more games. And they've got, they've got to get to a point where, you know, these kids are, are getting the, I don't know, the visibility they deserve. So one thing Hyman said to me is, is like, I never was above honorable mention all Big Ten. And I'm like, you're right. And you should have been. He's like, and he got drafted in front of like four guys who were who were picked ahead of him in all Big Ten. And Hymas, but Hymas wasn't bad in college. It wasn't like an upside deal. He really was good. And yet there were guys that didn't get drafted who 
ended up higher than he did in this all big 10 list. And that stuff matters. And like, so for, in the sense of Lamar Jackson, I'm not sure what happened, but anybody who's starting as a rookie, which he was, is, is probably somebody who should have been drafted. Well, how many, how many times have we seen Nebraska guys in the NFL that went undrafted that go on to have good careers? Right. Maybe they were playing out of position. Example of that. I mean, that's yeah. a big part of that. On the line, how many linemen went undrafted and went on to have good pro careers? Right. So, the, you know, uh, let's see. Lamar Jackson started six games last year, and he wasn't drafted. That seems odd to me. That just seems odd to me that, that you know, somebody we was like, yeah, we're not going to draft a guy that started last year. It was the Jets. We yeah, can't. That's maybe uh, more of a commentary on New York. Than uh, New York. Okay. I'm now, kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, you're right. You're 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 right in that sense. They weren't a great defense. They were the worst offense maybe in in football history. Their <laughs> defense wasn't great either. They weren't that bad, but that's part of the issue. Is like somewhere along the way, there's a there's a disconnect between what pro people think is coming out of Nebraska and what's actually coming out of Nebraska. Because Lamar Jackson probably should have been drafted. Like I can, I'm not trying to be like pro Lamar Jackson there and saying that he should have been drafted. Why wasn't he? I don't know. I mean, that's just a hard question to answer. But the point of your column is that Nebraska doesn't have the kind of players that are getting picked in the first two rounds of the draft. And I think that's probably true that they don't have those players in their program or if they do, they're not developing them. And Lamar Jackson indeed should have probably been a first would have been a three round, you know, first three round pick if he played for Frank Bowe, for example. Um, like, do you have any doubt that Lamar Jackson's going to have a better pro career than San, Stanley, you know, Jean Baptiste? I mean, it's too, no. I, I don't know. It's what a, I don't know. Stanley what, was picked in the second round. I know. I don't. I don't know all of the factors that went into Stanley's lack of success. Um, I think he was a, a measurable guy who they kind of fell in love with. Sure. Um, I, I, I think it's it, a trick question because he already has a better career. Stanley never started a game in the NFL. I know. Part, part of it is <laughs> so he already has one. Yeah. Part of it, it frankly, is Nebraska is not getting the just knock you off your socks measurables guy. Sure. I mean, Fabian, Fabian went in the first round because he was a knock you off of your chair measurables guy. Um, you know, Adam character went in the first round because he was a, he was a measurables guy. And, and no, you I'm, get not saying, I get I'm, not, I'm not saying he wasn't a great player, but, but you know, there's, there's certain guys who are, it, it almost doesn't matter what their production was in college because they just jump off the page, you know, when it comes no, to you're right. testing. And Nebraska has had very few of those guys over the last five years. Yeah. I think when you have a lot of coaching turnover, which Nebraska has, you lose allies. These kids lose allies in the program. And so, like, having Frost there for 10 years will help their NFL draft stock if he's there for 10 years. Nick Gates is another example. guy should have been drafted. Nick, Nick's a, Nick was a good player and is a good player now. Now, Nick had a weird junior year in 2017 because it all went sour and everybody was pissed off and people were just ready to screw this. But, I mean, Nick Gates just signed a two-year contract for $7 million and he's a starter and will be a starter for, you know, eight to ten years in the NFL. And he didn't get drafted. <laughs> so and some of, that's a little odd. Um, some of it's guys just falling through the cracks or whatever. The reason I like your column, Dirk, and this is true of a lot of the things you write, is it provokes so many thoughts in me because I'm like, that's true. Nebraska has not had this happen. And why has that not happened? And some of it, is, and there's so many different issues that that's how you know it's a problem is because you can talk about four different things and they're all kind of true. And that's when you're like, and that adds up to an issue. Like that's an issue. Iowa doesn't have that issue. Iowa's been able to produce and at first round NFL picks in what three of the last five years? Something like that. Yeah. I don't remember if Epinesa went in the first round, but yeah, Hawkinson he, did, Fant he, did. Including I was gonna say, including a guy from under Nebraska's uh, nose, Omaha South High School. So that's the worst miss of all the in-state dudes. That's the worst one. 
And that's Mike Riley's fault, Hank Hughes, but it's also Mike's fault. I went back and looked at a recruiting thing I read, wrote <laughs> some, something on a message board of how, how Nebraska was looking at Noah Fan as a defensive end. I'm like, what was Nebraska thinking? What were they thinking? <laughs> you just gave up the most explosive tight end in the country. And he went down to a he went down to a game on an unofficial visit and they didn't let him in the locker room. What were they thinking? What did we yeah. just what hey, what did we just say about about you know forwards at the six five forwards at the Boys State basketball tournament? Sam, you wrote a whole column about Noah Fant as a tight end on the floor at the Pinnacle Bank Arena in the state basketball tournament. Oh, no. And that's the worst one. And Harrison Phillips is probably number two. Um, people always mention Drew Ott, but I still think Fant and Phillips were <laughs> bigger whiffs. I don't know. I'm, it's going to be hard to ever top Noah Fant. That, that's going to be tough. And Helms and Riley Ducker, as good as they might be, Nebraska put their – Sean Becton did what he could. This doesn't have anything to do with Nebraska. It's, these are two kids that want to leave. And that's it. But Nebraska blew it with fan. All right. Evan, baseball. Bed crapping over the weekend. How that your fault. Yeah, my Blame fault. You. <laughs> yeah, no, that uh they lost a lot. I mean, they lost the three games. I was surprised to to Me too. have to look up on well, not just that they got swept. I was surprised at how they had never been swept at home in the Big Ten era. Like you gotta go back to Missouri in 09. Yeah. For the last time they were swept at home in a conference series. And it's only happened three times in their big 10 time in the last decade at all. Yeah. So like, I mean, that's a testament to how stable the program has been and, and maybe how not great the big 10 has been too. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, they lost their national ranking. They lost first place in the big 10 and they essentially lost the chance to host a regional because of, of what happened and when it happened. And, Yep. Of course, it's it's all made worse by the fact that it, you know, happens on the on the on the cusp of them uh, joining the top twenty five, and it happens at home on a weekend when a bunch of people are in town for the spring game for football. So I, I think, in some senses, it was blown out uh, a, a little bit from from people. It's, it's a little bit worse than it actually was. I mean, the bullpen did blow two games in the eighth inning, but. You know, they hadn't blown any to this point. They had, they were playing probably a little bit ahead of their skis for a lot of the year. Um, yeah. And so a lot of it just kind of came, came back on them at the same time. I mean, I, I wrote a piece uh, this week about some of the things that they've done differently the last two weeks when they've struggled from, from what it had been earlier in the season. And so, you know, a lot of it's been, they haven't had those big innings where you're scoring four or five runs. And when you do that, even in one inning, your bullpen is looking a lot better, right? Because it's not a one run game. There's not a ton of, of pressure hanging on every pitch as there might be. And then, you know, offensively, I think is, is where it's really been kind of scuffling. A lot of these guys just are hitting slumps at the same time. Nebraska's had the top six guys in their order, the, the same for 19 games in a row. And you go down and you look at some of the numbers. I mean, uh, you know, guys are two for 28 three for 26. Uh, there's just a lot of slumps that are coinciding at the same point. So, you know, they, they could have easily salvaged a game or won the series if they, if Friday and Saturday had gone a little bit differently, mm-hmm. but now it sets up a weekend this weekend, this pod series where they're playing two against Indiana, which is in first place, two more against Rutgers, which just came to Lincoln and swept you. Um, and, and it's really interesting because if Nebraska does well, if they respond and I think they can, they've shown that they have been able to do that all year, then they're right back in the thick of things. Then they're contending for the big 10 down the stretch. They're talking about postseason seating and all that. If you go one and three, or if you drop them all against some good teams, suddenly you're a bubble team and you go from the group that was projected to host a regional to being right on the fringe where your RPI is not good because you're in the big 10 and it's a league only schedule. So it is, it's a really, it's kind of a turning point sort of weekend where they had built up all this equity. They blew it last weekend. And so now what kind of tone do they set here for the stretch run in the next four weeks? I figured to catch up to their pitching a little bit. I, I, I figured that would happen. Just be you're right, Evan. It's, it's, uh... I'm surprised their offenses went down, but 
you make a great comparison. It's it, and this feels like it happens to Nebraska baseball several times uh, over the last fifteen years, where you know it's like the teenage kid that saves up sixty bucks, you know, mowing lawns, and then goes to the freaking county fair and burns it all on the Papa shot deal. Um, <laughs> You know they're back down to they're back down to twenty bucks. You know, and it's like, okay, what's what do you do now? Yeah, Evan, Evan, I could have used a casino metaphor with you, uh, but I chose to you know be a little bit more appropriate than that. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> they don't play. Nebraska men's athletics struggles to play with house money. Um, using the casino metaphor, I. So many different times when Nebraska football, especially under Bo, had a chance to win something really big and they just fell short. They're they're up 17-0 against OU in the 2010 Big Ten Championship and play really three really bad quarters of football. Like they should have won that game. They know they should have, and they blow it. Um all they have to do is kick the ball into the end zone in the 2009 Big 12 championship game, and they can't. Nebraska basketball has this big game against Michigan at the Big Ten tournament. And not only do they lose, but they're not there. They're not. They don't even. They they were out of it. You know, they didn't play well. They go to the NCAA tournament, and they look like a JV team against Baylor. They did. Sort of Creighton. But they look like a JV team. Um, Rarely, there 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 are exceptions to the rule. No sit Sunday is one. Um, but if you think about like the last two regionals they've hosted, which were a long time ago, I know, but those were, those were flops. I mean, and so it feels like within the the athletic program, when they get on the cusp of something really big, that's when they fall short. Yeah. And that was a cusp weekend. Why do you guys think that is? Because I always get the sense that they start reading their headlines or they start checking the message boards or like they feel the gravity of the moment more than most teams across the country. And I know we follow Nebraska <clears throat> closer than we do other teams, but it just doesn't, it feels like other teams don't get caught up or, or crumble under these kind of pressure situations the way Nebraska has in these big moments. And, and maybe that's because Nebraska athletics is the only show in town and some of these other teams can operate more anonymously that plays into it probably, but doesn't it feel that way? Like it just, these are, these are situations psychologically that you don't see play out with a lot of other teams that are trying to break through around the country. I don't know, Evan. I, I, feel, I feel like it's the question of the last 20 years. In some cases, I, I think Nebraska just wasn't good enough. Um, you know, that 2012 big 12, big 10 championship game against Wisconsin. No, they shouldn't have lost 70 to 31. But they also shouldn't have been ten and two going into that game. So that's true. Um, you know, that's some true. of these some of these baseball teams over the last 10, 15 years, you know, the ones that got into May and and looked like they might be a regional host or you know a top two seed in the NCAA's and then crumbled. Uh, I'm not sure they were good enough to start with. So it's a lot of different things. I think it's probably a little bit more team specific than we identify, but. Um, but I think your, your point is valid that the, the fan base tends to get excited about these things that, you know, that are not, not fully formed, right. That the accomplishment is not complete. And the interesting part is you contrast it with a volleyball program that runs into pressure time and time again and steps up. Uh, and that doesn't mean they win every match, but, you know, I feel like they've, they've done a much better job of rising to the occasion um, I don't know. I, I think it's it's probably a lot of different variables. Well, I think as it relates to Cook, the one thing that uh, that we know is true about about Coach Cook is that he's constantly he's constantly putting players into the in in the, in the matches that he thinks are going to win the matches. Like he's not afraid to put freshmen in um, to 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 put freshmen in over seniors if he thinks they're going to win the game. I mean, I think John Cook does an excellent job of winning volleyball games. He's just really good at that. Um, as it related to baseball, Evan, I don't know if this is going to be true of Old Bolt or not. I, I would say that his predecessor 
was so like every game is the same that when they went to the regional and they lost it, who did the hell did they lose to? Yale, uh, Yale, Yale, and Holy Cross. Wag- Wagner, or I don't even remember who the second team was. Holy Cross. Like, this, this team is not prepared to do anything here because this is this is not, you know, the coach did not prepare them to to go into these games with a heightened sense of whatever. And so there was that moment um, in basket in, in football. I think it was Bo centric. I mean, Bo. Bo got those guys into such an emotional state that when things went bad in big games, they, they collapsed. They just literally we're going to lose now. And so that was some of Bo and Bo that what Bo was excellent at was motivating through negative emotions and fear. And so they never lost games. They shouldn't have won. They shouldn't have lost. They were brilliant at that. They, they almost lost to McNeese state, but they didn't lose to McNeese state. They almost lost to, you know, crap team a, but they didn't lose to crap team a. Right. Well, Under okay. Riley and Frost, they've lost to crap team a. Yeah. Two points on that. One, <laughs> they beat McNeese State because they had the best player on the field. Yes, they did. Uh, sports, yeah. you know, Nebraska, <laughs> Nebraska football, especially, they need the best right. player. They need the best player on the damn field. Yeah. Uh, secondly, there, there's this weird paradox with college sports where these high school kids have no concept of history. They don't care what uniform they wear. Uh, they, you know, you, you throw them into a program and, and they're just, you know, completely oblivious. And at the same time, if that program, some of these programs that don't have a pattern or a quote culture of winning, uh, it's so hard for them to get over the hump. You know, it's like, why is it that a 17 year old kid, if you send him to one program, he flourishes at age 19. And if you send him to another one, he you know, consistently comes up short of his own personal expectations and potential. Uh, I don't get it. I think it's one of the, you know, especially in this transfer climate, it, that question becomes probably even more interesting. But uh, to me, it's just this incredible paradox where kids really don't know, you know, they don't know that Nebraska hasn't won anything in 20 years. They, they haven't been following all those frustrations. They don't know anything about the 2009, 2012 conference championship games. And at the same time, when they come here, it's like those expectations and burdens fall on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, why is that? I don't know. Big weekend for the baseball team. I, <laughs> I, I suspect they'll go two and two. As it relates to the current baseball team, Evan, and there's – I'm not going to use the player's name because why do we need to? But there's a current player on that team, and we've talked about this player before. We're like, so long as that player is still on that team, they haven't arrived yet. And and play and playing as much as that player does, you know, they still have issues. And uh, you sooner or later, what you hope for the baseball program and for basketball or whatever is that for basketball, for example, Charlie easily isn't getting major minutes anymore because, you know, the game's on the line at Rutgers. If he makes the three, they're going to win the game. And that's not the guy you want out there shooting the corner three. Sure. It's just not. It makes for a great story if he makes it, but he didn't make it. And now he's at South Dakota and he's a great kid. And he, he but that's what I mean is that there's, there's still too many guys within the baseball program we're getting a lot of at bats and a lot of moments of games, and it's like so long as those players are getting those kind of moments, you know that there's still room to grow. Yeah, and there's no debating that. I mean, if Drew Cristo were at Nebraska right now, he'd be a weekend starter for them, probably. I mean, he's, yes, he he's, would. He's that good. So, like, they they have guys coming in, and you talk about rebuilds for for football. I mean, this is still just the second year for baseball, and and they're their growing year was wiped out by the pandemic. That year one was not going to be a great baseball team in 2020. They had bullpen issues, a lot of, a lot of different issues that they solved through the transfer portal and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're getting there, but what I, I do think they have a really contrast this with what we just talked about with Nebraska football, like Nebraska baseball absolutely knows what it wants to be. I mean, the coaches can in detail tell you, how they want their offense to be. They can in detail tell you what they're looking for in their different pitchers. 
They can tell you how they're recruiting and where these different guys fit into the grid of a team. And the culture thing too. I mean, I can't tell you how many guys this year have said like the phrase, I don't care as it relates to circumstances with traveling, as it relates to slumps, like it's as a guy who covers both programs a lot, like it's just, it's so different. The, the culture that they have over their, their vision, how they execute it. Um, and I know it's a different sport and, and it's harder to protect football players, certainly than the baseball it. players at a young age. But uh, like, I can see kind of where that's going. The football thing, it, it, like we've said, it's still kind of cooking. Like we don't really know how that's going to shake out. The baseball thing, they know where they want to go. They might not have the talent to be there yet, but it does feel like they're heading that way pretty imminently. Cool. Let's end on an up note. Um, that's all we have for this week. I think we'll be back next week. I don't know. <laughs> we'll talk more baseball, maybe a little more football. We'll talk basketball. Nebraska basketball added a guy on, on Monday. I don't think many people know much of that about that guy. We need to have kind of a roster reset and just sort of a summer conversation about that, and then we'll pick up basketball again in the fall. But we'll have a conversation in the next couple of weeks about where that program's at. They feel like they're in a good spot, but we'll talk about it. And then um, more football, I suppose. But that's that's all we've kind of got for this moment. So uh, for Evan Bland and Dirk Chatlin, I'm Sam McEwen. Thanks for listening to the uh, Pick 6 Podcast. Take care.